evening. Stephen Markman was appointed Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court in 1999 and re-elected in 2000 and 2004. Prior to that, he served as judge on the Michigan Court of Appeals. He has practiced law with the firm of Miller, Canfield, Paddock, and Stone in Detroit. And, and from 1989 to 1993, he served as the United States Attorney in Michigan. As the United States Attorney, he was responsible for one of the largest federal prosecutor's offices in the nation and received national attention for his efforts in combating violent street crime and public corruption. Prior to this, Justice Markman served for four years as the Assistant Attorney General of the United States. After being nominated by President Reagan and confirmed by the U.S. Senate. In that position, he headed the Justice Department's Office of Legal Policy, which served as the principal policy development office within the department, and which coordinated the federal ju judicial selection process. Prior to this, he served as Chief Counsel of the United States Senate Subcommittee on the Constitution and as Deputy Chief Counsel of the United States Senate Judiciary Committee for seven years. Justice Markman has authored scholarly articles for such publications as the Stanford Law Review, the University of Chicago Law Review, the University of Michigan Journal of Law Reform, the American Criminal Justice Law Review, and the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. He has also served as a contributing editor for National View Review Magazine. Since 1993, Justice Markman has taught constitutional law at Hillsdale College as a distinguished visiting professor in, of political science. Tonight, Justice Markman will explain the idea of the 21st century constitution. He will explain uh, what, it's, it's what it means to the enduring principles of our constitution and how we might better address these matters in our judicial confirmation process. Please join me in wel welcoming Justice Stephen Markman. Well, thank you very much for being here. That was a much nicer introduction than when I received not too long ago when I was introduced by the Master of Ceremonies as being one of the finest judges that money could buy. Um, I think he was trying to say something nice. I'm just not sure it came across perfectly. Uh, my wife, who was with me that same day, Mary Kathleen, was introduced by the same Master of Ceremonies as being one of the finest ladies to walk the streets. And uh, I think she was similarly, per similarly perplexed by the introduction. So thank you very much. I, I'm grateful. Um, I would like to talk about what I call the continuing constitutional non-debate, and then I very much look forward to any questions and insights that you might have, because I can benefit greatly from those. I'm still trying to develop the theme and the topic, because so I think it's extraordinarily important, particularly in this year, when there may be as many as some two vacancies on the United States Supreme Court. But as David indicated, uh, David Bob indicated, as Assistant Attorney General under President Reagan, I prepared a report for the Attorney General uh, entitled The Constitution in the Year 2000, Choices Ahead. This report sought to identify a range of areas in which significant constitutional controversy could be expected over the ensuing 20 years. By preparing this report, I sought to provide a glimpse of the stakes involved in the then ongoing public debates over federal judicial selection and competing understandings of the proper role of the judiciary. And I also sought to identify what I call forks in the road that would determine the changing contours of American constitutionalism. The controversies identified in the Constitution in the year 2000, as important as I think they were, pall in significance before the controversies that I think will almost certainly arise over the next several decades. For those of us, and I assume there's at least a few in the room, who believe in a traditional constitutionalism to James Madison's Constitution, the resolution of these emerging controversies will determine 
whether the Constitution of 2030 bears any resemblance to the Constitution of the Reagan years, much less to the Constitution that guided this nation for most of its first two centuries. It is critical that those who are committed to preserving our traditional Constitution understand clearly the nature of the upcoming litigative offensive by proponents of what I call the 21st century Constitution. There is nothing that such proponents would like more than to transform beyond recognition and with a minimum of nettlesome public attention, uh, a constitution that served this country during the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries to render the United States the freest, the most prosperous, and the most creative nation in the history of the world. If there's an overarching theme to what proponents of a 21st century constitution wish to achieve, it is the diminishment of the democratic and representative processes of American government. It is the replacement of a system of Republican self-government with a system of judicial government in which substantive policy outcomes are increasingly determined by unaccountable federal judges. Rather than merely defining broad rules of the game for the legislative and executive branches of government, the new Constitution would compel specific outcomes. Yes, there would remain the forms of the Founders' Constitution, the bicameral legislature, the periodic elections, the states, but the most important decisions, those determining the nature and direction of the continuing American experiment in liberty and self-rule, would increasingly be undertaken by courts, especially by federal courts populated by lawyers in black robes, lawyers serving lifetime tenures, and lawyers unencumbered by the messiness of having to persuade constituencies or the representatives of other constituencies of the wisdom of their ideas concerning the role of government. These courts would be unmoored in any serious way from the language that we the people had placed in their constitution and informed instead by the perspectives of a legal profession whose self-interests are ever more distinct from the productive sector and by international elite opinion and by creative and innovative legal academics. It will be, I submit, the California referendum process writ national, a process by which the decisions of millions of voters on matters such as racial quotas, social services funding, and immigration policy have been routinely overturned by a single judge acting in the name of the Constitution a constitution that not only would have been unrecognizable to its creators, but unrecognizable to all the past generations of judges who have ever sat on the courts of this land. If 21st century constitutionalism prevails, there will be no accompanying public debate, at least not one in which ordinary citizens will have any effective voice. There will be no public debate over the transformation of the Constitution, and once it has been transformed, there will be no public debate over countless matters of policy that are now routinely the subject of hearings, negotiations, compromises, and give and take within the representative process. Rather, such debate will be short-circuited by the decisions of judges acting on behalf of a Constitution for our time a modern constitution, a living constitution, resembling, sadly, the constitutions of failed and crippled nations across the globe. The constitutional revolutionaries of the early part of our century contemplated America transformed, not after any modern equivalent of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, not as a result of any landmark votes of those whom the people have elected to represent their values, not through the considered judgments of the electorate, and not by any series of transformative elections, but by a decision of five lawyers on the Supreme Court and a handful of others serving on the lower federal judiciary. The adoption of the 21st century Constitution will occur not through high-profile court decisions resolving grand disputes of war and peace, abortion, capital punishment, or the place of religious values in public life, but more likely it will occur as a result of decisions resolving utterly forgettable and mundane disputes, the kind mentioned on page A11 of our daily newspapers, if at all.
for it is the legal principles and precepts of 21st century constitutionalism that will prove so destructive to our values. And once these values and precepts have been incorporated into the supreme law of the land, they will then be insinuated into our daily lives through countless decisions of state and federal courts <coughs> acting upon these newly established precedents. They will be ingrained or institutionalized in our law well before the average citizen begins to appreciate their consequences. We the people will then have established a constitution in, we the, in which we the people have become irrelevant. <laughs> Let me provide, if I might, just a brief summary of several of the more popular theories by which advocates of the 21st century Constitution hope to transform the Founders' Constitution. In particular, I hope to address these thoughts to ordinary citizens so that they can, so that they can be made better aware of the states. While judges and lawyers may be its custodian, the Constitution is a document that's the heritage of every American citizen. First of all is the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. Since shortly after the Civil War, the Privileges or Immunities Clause has been understood as protecting citizens from a very limited array of rights that are a function of their federal citizenship, such as the right to be heard in courts of justice and the right to diplomatic protection. In defining the protections of the Privileges or Immunities Clause in this way, the Supreme Court in the slaughterhouse cases rejected the argument that the clause also protects rights that are a function of state citizenship, asserting that this would lead to federal courts serving as a perpetual censor over state and local governments. Moreover, as a result of other language in the 14th Amendment authorizing the Congress to enforce its provisions, the court in Slaughterhouse also indicated its concerns that the Privileges or Immunities Clause was intended to bring within Congress, Congress's authority the entire domain of powers belonging exclusively to the states. Thus, the slaughterhouse cases has served as one very long-standing foundation of American federalism. Now, although a considerable degree of federal judicial authority has alternatively been achieved over the states in slaughterhouse through interpretations of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, many proponents of the 21st century have found it awkward to pursue the substantive review of state and local laws under a constitutional provision that is geared only toward ensuring compliance with fair procedures. Thus, the long-standing interest of such proponents in refashioning the Privileges or Immunities Clause as the new Bill of Rights within the 14th Amendment. It is seen as a strength of the Privileges or Immunities Clause that there are no established limits as to what rights would be encompassed within its terms. The practical consequences of a broadened privileges or immunities clause would be to authorize federal judges to embark upon a far more aggressive review of state and local decision making and thereby to impose a broad and stultifying uniformity upon the states. Professor Goodwin Liu of the University of California, for example, has suggested that at a minimum, the Privileges or Immunities Clause stands for the proposition that all citizens enjoy substantive rights essential to realizing what he calls as equal standing in the national political community, and that both the courts and Congress may determine what civil and political rights and what social and economic entitlements are necessary to make national citizenship meaningful and effective. This is no standard at all, and to the extent it gives meaning to the Privileges or Immunities Clause, it would ensure that whatever modicum of federalism remains extant right now, considerably less will remain tomorrow. All state laws and all local laws will be subject then to substantive review by federal courts. Issue number two, positive rights. These, these are arcane concepts, many of these, but these are the building blocks upon which the new Constitution is going to be built, 
And unless ordinary citizens understand these issues, we are not gonna win in the courtrooms or the classrooms of the land. Positive rights. For the 21st century constitutionalist, perhaps, as I say, the greatest virtue to redefining the Privileges or Immunities Clause is the prospect of transforming the Constitution from what they view as an archaic 18th century guarantor of negative liberties into a genuinely contemporary charter of affirmative government, guaranteeing individuals an array of positive constitutional rights. These are all their terms as President Obama has observed in his criticism of the legacy of the Warren Court, it never ventured into the issues of the redistribution of wealth and of more basic issues of political and economic justice in society. The Warren Court simply wasn't that radical. It didn't break free from the essential constraints that were placed by the Founding Fathers in the Constitution that generally the Constitution is a charter of negative liberties says what the states can't do to you, says what's, what the federal government can't do, do to you, but doesn't say what the federal government or state government must do on your behalf. So says the president. And I believe President Obama's correct. The Constitution of the Founding Fathers, unlike most modern constitutions, does define individual rights in negative terms in terms of what the government cannot do to you. The government, for example, cannot inflict upon you cruel and unusual punishment, and therefore you have a constitutional and individual right not to be subject to such punishment. The government cannot engage in unreasonable searches and seizures, and therefore, again, you have a constitutional or individual right not to be subject to such seizures, and so forth. Constitutional rights are defined in terms of what remains after governmental overreaching has been prohibited. By contrast, unlike the typical third world constitution, ours does not afford affirmative welfare state rights to material goods such as housing, education, food, clothing, a job, or health care rights in which there is a correlative obligation upon the state to obtain the resources from other citizens to pay for these rights. That is, if there's a constitutional right to free health care, then there's a constitutional obligation on the part of government to raise revenues to pay for such health care. Proponents of the 21st century constitution have many grievances with the individual rights premises of our current constitution. The procedural focus of the Due Process Clause, with its old-fashioned conception of individual rights as those relating to life, liberty, and property, and the negative cast of the very few specifically defined rights of the Bill of Rights. These each pose significant barriers to what 21st century constitutionalists hope to achieve in reconfiguring America. The Privileges or Immunities Clause, on the other hand, suffers from none of these infirmities. Best of all, it is ill-defined and easily susceptible by definition, to definition by judges, more or less at their own discretion. In short, in the words of Professor Balkan of the Yale Law School, there would be nothing left of the founders to fetishize. As various 21st century constitution advocates have urged, a privilege or immunity might become anything pertaining to equal opportunity or basic rights. It might encompass any social or universal right, or it might be construed to guarantee social or economic equality. These again are all their terms. And however pleasing these turns of phrase, there should be no mistake. Each of these, each of these uh, terms will supplant representative decision-making with the decision-making of unelected, unaccountable, and life-tenured judges. Although it was once said of our Constitution that it does not enact Herbert Spencer's concept of laissez-faire capitalism, we will soon see whether it does today enact a European welfare state or even a more rigid form of socialism.
if the 21st century constitutional view prevails, ours will be in America defined by a constitution in which citizens are entitled to what is possessed by their neighbors, in which economic redistribution has become as ingrained a principle as federalism and the separation of powers, in which the great constitutional controversies of the day will focus upon whether poor should be subsidized and housing allowances subsidized at 89% or 94% of the last fiscal year level in, and in which a succession of new rights will be parceled out to the people when they are deemed worthy by the successors to our founding fathers on the bench. In short, it will be a constitution no longer informed by an 18th century declaration of independence, but by a 21st century declaration of dependence. Third, there's a concept of state action. A barrier posed by both by the due process and privileges and immunities clause and viewed as anachronistic by proponents of the 21st century constitution is the requirement of state action as a precondition for the enforcement of constitutional rights. And in the civil rights cases, another post-Civil War precedent, the Supreme Court asserted that the 14th Amendment prohibited only the abridgment of individual rights by the state state. They said, it is state action of a particular character that is prohibited. The wrongful act of an individual is simply a private wrong, and if not sanctioned in some way by the state, or not done under state authority, the individual's rights remain in full force. However, for advocates of a 21st century constitutionalism, if fairness and equity as they perceive these are to be achieved, the Constitution must become more like a general legal code applicable indistinguishably to matters public and private. Fourteenth Amendment claims of due process and equal protection and privileges and immunities must be applied to private institutions as they now apply exclusively to state institutions. Consider, for example, an institution that you may have heard about, in fact, within the last few minutes, Hillsdale College. Despite being the embodiment of a thoroughly private institution, government officials have sought to justify the imposition of federal rules and regulations upon Hillsdale by characterizing it as the equivalent of a state entity on the grounds that it received public grants and aid. When in response to this argument, and in order to retain its independence, Hillsdale rejected further grants and aid. The government then sought to justify its rules and regulations on the grounds that Hillsdale was the indirect beneficiary of grants and aids going to individual students, such as GI benefits. Once again, in response to this rationale, Hillsdale asserted its independence by disallowing its students from receiving public grants even those earned, as in the case of GI benefits, and instead bolstered its own scholarship resources. We have thus witnessed a steadily more aggressive effort by government regulators to treat a variety of private institutions as the equivalent of the state and thereby to extend the reach of the 14th Amendment. However, it would be so much more convenient simply to nullify the state action requirement altogether, and that is what's proposed. Professor Mark Tushnet of Harvard Law School instructs us times have changed and that he would overrule the civil rights cases. He says the state requirement doctrine contributes nothing but in clarity to constitutional analysis. It works as a boogeyman because it appeals to a vague libertarian sense that Americans have about the proper relationship between themselves and government. It seems to suggest that there is some domain of freedom unto which the Constitution doesn't reach. We would be well rid of the doctrine. Now, if Professor Tushnet succeeds in this mission, Hillsdale's policies concerning such things as tuition, diversity, admissions, curriculum, multiculturalism, affirmative action, and discipline will each have to pass the scrutiny and receive the imprimatur of judges. Fourth is the concept of political questions. 
in areas that were once viewed as entirely inappropriate for judicial involvement, federal courts have begun to assert themselves in an unprecedentedly aggressive manner. The limited role, for example, of the judiciary with regard to matters of national defense and foreign policy is not explicitly set forth in the Constitution, but from time immemorial, it has been understood that matters of defense and foreign policy were non-justiciable and within the exclusive responsibility of the elected accountable branches of government. That is the Constitution's judicial power which is the only power that courts can exercise, has always been understood to require deference to the judgments of popular branches. As far back as Marbury versus Madison in 1803, Chief Justice Marshall recognized that questions in their nature political can never be made in this court. Yet just since the year 2000, just since the beginning of this century, the court has arrogated unto itself in a series of five to four decisions authority concerning the treatment of captured enemy combatants, overruling in the process contrary determinations made by both the legislative and executive branches. Most notably, the court ruled in Boumediene versus Bush that foreign nationals captured in combat and held out outside the United States by the military as prisoners of war, a war authorized by the Congress and waged by the President as Commander in Chief, that such individuals possess the constitutional right to challenge their detentions in federal court. Thus in yet one more realm of public policy, one as to which the sovereignty and liberty of a free people are most dependent, national defense, judges have now begin to, begun to embark upon a sharply expanded role. The Supreme Court has bestowed under the Constitution rights upon enemy combatants who previously enjoyed none. It has overturned the decisions of the president in the process. It has transformed the Constitution's apportionment of powers by asserting the commander-in-chief's authority may require what it calls the vindication of judges and the court has established an ongoing role of federal judges in devising procedures by which the judicial review of military detention decisions can meaningfully be carried out. If there is no realm of political questions left, areas in which the courts are gonna to deter to other branches or other decision makers, if there are no longer any traditional limitations upon the exercise of the judicial power, then every matter coming before every president, every Congress, every governor, every legislature, and every county commission and city council can with no difficulty at all be recast as a justiciable dispute or case or controversy. And if that occurs, every policy debate taking place within government at every level will eventually become little more than a prelude for court resolution. Number five is the concept of the Ninth Amendment. This is another looming constitutional battleground, the meaning of the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution. Many 21st century constitutionalists view the amendment as communicating that there is some unknown array of unenumerated rights that lie fallow in the Constitution, waiting only to be unearthed by far-sighted judges applying their own conceptions of natural justice. Professor Thomas Gray of the Stanford Law School stated, for example, that the Ninth Amendment constitutes a license to courts to look beyond the substantive commands of the constitutional text to protect fundamental rights not expressed therein. Rights of abortion, for example, contraception, and homosexual behavior, and similar sexual privacy rights have already been imposed by judges detecting such rights in the Ninth Amendment. However, in the words of Justices Potter Stewart and Hugo Black, this understanding turns somersaults with history and would render the court a day-to-day -day constitutional convention. Instead, the more conventional understanding of the amend amendment has viewed, it, has viewed it always in the historical context of the Bill of Rights of which it is part. By this traditional understanding, the Ninth Amendment was simply designed to dispel any implication 
that by the specification of particular rights in the Bill of Rights, the people had relinquished to the federal government rights not specified or enumerated. It was well understood by framers such as Madison and Hamilton that the guarantees of the Bill of Rights merely comprised a partial enumeration of rights reserved to the people with the remainder of the rights to be enforced by the states or left to the people. The Ninth Amendment, like the Tenth Amendment, was adopted to emphasize that our national government is one of limited powers. Its purpose was to avoid an implied extension of federal power. The Ninth Amendment authorizes courts to declare unconstitutional acts of Congress that exceed its limited authority, even where such acts do not con contravene a specific provision of the Bill of Rights. As Justice Anthony Kennedy has written, the Ninth Amendment expresses a recognition of state sovereignty and of the role of states in defining human rights. It is not an open-ended grant of judicial authority, an inkblot in Ju Judge Bork's terms, that would allow federal judges to transform a statement of limited constitutional government into a warrant for unlimited government. Sixth concept is transnationalism. Professor Harold Coe, now State Department legal counsel, is perhaps the leading proponent of what he describes as transnationalism. He compares this with what he describes as the nationalist philosophy that has somehow taken hold of the Amer American law for the past 220 years. He says, Transnationalists tend to believe in the political and economic interdependence of nations, while nationalists focus instead on preserving United States autonomy. The transnationalists recognize that international and domestic law are merging into a hybrid body of transnational law, while nationalists preserve a rigid division between domestic and foreign law. Transnationalists believe that domestic courts have a role to play in incorporating international law into domestic law, while nationalists complain that only the political branches are authorized to domesticate international legal norms. Professor Coe, remember the counsel, the legal counsel at the State Department, now predicts that the clash between competing visions of constitutional law as he describes them, between transnationalism and nationalism, will play out in future Supreme Court confirmation hearings and that these will be pivotal in determining by the year 2020 the direction in which the United States, is, States law proceeds. He says, what the United States and the world will look like if we just let constitutional change happen, and what it will look like if we seize this moment to push our constitutionalism and our policies in better directions will be at stake in the next few Supreme Court confirmations. In practice, transnationalism would legitimize reliance by American judges upon foreign law in giving meaning to the United States Constitution it would bind federal and state governments to international treaties and agreements that had never been ratified by the United States, much less enacted into law by Congress. It would render both the domestic and international conduct of the U.S. increasingly beholden to the review and judgment of international tribunals in Geneva and The Hague. It would expose American soldiers and elected leaders to the sanctions of international law for imagined war crimes and violations of the earth, and it would uh, once again replace the judgments of officials representing the American people and holding paramount the interest of the United States of America with the judgments of European bureaucrats and multinational panels of judges finally and precisely balancing the interests of this country with the interests of authoritarians and dictators throughout the world. In conclusion, President Obama has stated, what matters on the Supreme Court is those 5% of cases that are truly difficult. In those cases, adherence to precedent 
and rules of construction and interpretation will only get you to the 25th mile of the marathon. That last mile can only be determined on the basis of a judge's deepest values, core concerns, and broader perspectives on how the world works and the breadth of his or her empathy. Now, if the 21st century Constitution prevails, there will be a far higher figure than 5% of cases as to which nothing would matter more than a judge's deepest values, core concerns, and breadth of empathy. Judges would be making more decisions, and they would be making more decisions in which the law would only get you through the 25th mile if indeed it got judges anywhere close to that. For the central value of 21st First century constitutionalism is not the Constitution, but the judge. And it is with the intention of generating debate and providing a brief roadmap to the constitutional forks in the road that will soon be facing our nation that I offer these thoughts. While there's never been a time in our history at which there was not some serious constitutional debate within our people, I would respectfully suggest that there have been few times at which this debate was more stark and more fundamental in defining the American experiment. Thank you very much. Um, let's take uh, questions for a few minutes and I, I really do look forward to your thoughts and I'll try to respond as best as I can. Does anybody have any thoughts or insights? Oh, what, what can be done to, to stop this trend? <laughs> That's for the next speech. Uh, uh, actually, I, I, I've written lengthier remarks that develop these subjects a little bit more precisely, and these are going to be published by the Kirby Cent Center on their site and a monograph produced. And in those, I have a number of recommendations concerning uh, the procedures of the Senate Judiciary Committee in holding its confirmations. But most of all, what I want to do by uh, working with Hillsdale College and the Kirby Center is communicate to, to, to groups of people who may not be part of the inside, uh, the, the inner constitutional sanctum, what is at stake right now. So hopefully there will be more interest um, communicated to their elected officials and eventually the elected officials, particularly those in the United States Senate who participate in this process, might take an interest in trying to focus the confirmation hearings on these matters. I mean, there have been many very disappointing confirmation hearings in the past. Uh, I thought the one with regard to Justice Sotomayor was actually a good step in the right direction, but I think we continue to have to encourage members of the uh, Senate to uh, devote even more focus to constitutional issues. I guess most of all what I'd like in the confirmation process would be an increasing focus not just on uh, Judge Smith or Judge Jones who's actually before the committee, but I wish these would be used increasingly as an opportunity to assess the health of the Constitution and to analyze the, 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 the great uh, constitutional debates of the time to try to um, inquire of, of, of judicial nominees what they think about these issues. Uh, I think there's a, a real misunderstanding on the part of, uh, of many senators as to what constitutes an appropriate kind of inquiry, and uh, many people have a lot of confusion about that. I think it's altogether appropriate to ask questions about how a judicial candidate proposes to resolve a constitutional dispute that is what they would look to, what the evidence that they believe would be appropriate to consider in that process. I don't believe it's proper to ask how would you decide a particular precise case in the future, but I do believe it's proper to ask them questions about larger contra constitutional controversies. What do you think about a colorblind constitution? This has been a matter of debate in the United States for the past 30 years. What do you think about a colorblind constitution? What do you think about the debate that Professor Coe defines between the nationalist and the transnationalist? I think these are proper, entirely proper debates. You know, the advice and consent process is the choke point of our constitutional process. Once a judge, a judicial nominee, gets beyond that choke point, he's on the bench for the rest of his life, 
and I think it's entirely proper for senators, and I'm talking about senators of both parties, inquiring of judicial nominees of both parties, it's entirely proper to inquire uh, just what kind of custodian a judicial nominee will become if he is blessed with this opportunity to define our Constitution for the rest of his or her life. And I don't think senators need to be apologetic about that. I think they need to understand this is one of the most important responsibilities that they carry out, especially those on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Yes, sir, in the back. Thank you. I discussed a little bit the Congress's ability to restrict the jurisdiction of the court and recent uh, experience in that area. I'm sorry? Congress's ability to restrict the jurisdiction of the court and recent experiences in that exercise of power. Well, that's, that's a significant constitutional issue. Um, people don't always agree. Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution gives the Congress the right to limit the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. It was done most famously in a post-Civil uh, War during a, a Reconstruction era case in which the Congress uh, attempted to limit the court's exercise of certain habeas corpus rights directed towards some of the Southern Confederate rebels, and uh, the Supreme Court said, you and the Congress have the right to do this, and therefore we can't continue to hear those cases. So in the one constitutional challenge that we've actually heard to that precept, the court said Congress does have this authority. Um, you know, Al Regnery is here, and he and I served in the Justice Department, and, and you remember the early 1980s when Attorney General William Prince Smith broached the idea of doing this with regard to issues like abortion and school prayer and school busing. There was a great deal of controversy. These uh, initiatives eventually didn't go anywhere. And they didn't go anywhere, at least in part, because there is some discomfort level on the part of some senators about the proposition of limiting the jurisdiction of courts. They're not quite sure how far they can go. And uh, I think there needs to be a lot more education and a lot more discussion as to what the breadth of that right is. It's an important provision of the Constitution. It is arguably designed to be one of the more significant checks and balances upon the court, but it uh, just hasn't served that way since members of Congress have not been willing to uh, try to challenge judicial uh, authority in that way. But the one time it was done, it was upheld by the court. So it is a, it's a very, very interesting precedent. Uh, Steve, first of all, um, you referred to Professor Liu at uh, Berkeley. I, I don't think I made a point. Uh, Obama yesterday in that circuit. You know, I just learned that today. I mean, I was really quite, um, uh, quite interested to hear that. Um, in, in the longer paper that I have, I quote from Professor Liu on several occasions. Uh, he's given me just the right quotes for my analysis in a number of different areas. I quoted from him once today, of course, but um, I think that'll be an extraordinarily interesting nomination. Um, Professor Liu is very much a part of the community that I've tried to describe today, and um, I've spoken with um, uh, a number of offices, not urging any particular action on this nomination. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not involved in any particular nomination controversy, but I, I think I expect there will be a lot of questioning of uh, the candidate uh, based upon the kind of lines that I'm introducing here. Um, I don't know Professor Liu. I don't know his credentials. I know some of his thoughts on the Constitution. So I'm not urging any particular course of action, but I think it'll probably be almost certainly an opportunity in which some of the elements of what constitute 21st century constitutionalism will be ventilated, and uh, I would very much look forward to seeing what happens at that time. Now, I do have a question, actually, related, and that is, uh, I wonder if you could talk for a minute about um, how hard this might be to undo. Assume that these things happen, we've talked about, and assume somewhere down the line the country comes to assess as a conservative president and a bunch of conservative senators, and other people are being appointed, I mean, judges in school and, uh, and the Alito, Clarence Thomas, so on, mold. Um, to what extent will they have an opportunity to bring us back to where we were before? 
Well, that's, a, that's a very, very good question. And, um, you know, what I think about when you ask that question, it really hits at a, a core matter here is that I'm going to be speaking at the Federalist Society this weekend in Philadelphia, and the subject of my panel is uh, originalism and precedent. Um, I guess it all depends on what kind of decisions are, are, are articulated by the 21st century constitutionalists, but even more it depends on what the successor president appoints in terms of um, more traditional constitutionalists. Are these going to be traditional constitutionalists who will typically defer to precedent, in which case we would have preserved what has occurred under the 21st century constitutional regime, or will it be judges whose priority is to restore what they view as an originalist understanding of what the Constitution means? I mean, this is an ongoing debate, and you'll find interpretivists or originalists or textualists, whatever you want to call them, or constitutional conservatives, some of whom do place an emphasis on regard and respect for precedent, and others of whom say no, the oath of office that judges take is not to what the judge on their court said 10 years ago, but what the Constitution says. So I think that's the debate that we're see in terms of determining whether or not the, what's done can be undone, or simply will have to be more deeply institutionalized and ingrained in the law. And you know as well as I do that for so many years, many conservatives looked upon constitutional and statutory interpretation is somewhat of a ratchet theory. Remember, uh, when Justice Douglas said, I prefer to make precedent rather than follow precedent. And there were just too many conservatives who were content once those precedents were initiated by Justice Douglas to acknowledge those precedents and sustain those precedents. And I think it's only been within recent decades that there's been a sense that um, to abide by that kind of practice is going to ensure that things ratchet in ever in, in an ever worse direction. We can never restore a responsible sense of constitutionalism. So I guess in addition to the debate over the 21st century constitutionalism, what you're asking, Al, is um, how is the debate going to be conducted within the conservative community between those whose priority is stare decisis or precedent and those whose priority is trying to restore what they understood Madison placed in his constitution. And, and I've mentioned Madison several times here, by the way. Obviously, as the father of the constitution, you can understand that, but it's not just Madison's constitution that we're talking about any longer. We're talking about Lincoln's constitution as well. There's a constitution that Lincoln gave us was a constitution interpreted within a matter of just a few years by the United States Supreme Court, and that today is the constitution that's under challenge. Both of their constitutions are under challenge, but it's not just the Madisonian constitution of 1789, it's also the Lincolnian constitution of the 1860s. We are talking about a transformation of the constitution that is um, literally without precedent in our nation's history, and it's both of those constitutions that are at stake, not just the constitution of the 18th century, but also the one of the 19th century and the one that's been preserved until the year 2010. Does that answer now? Karen. Steve, how would you compare uh, to the great yeah. yes, please. Mm -hmm. See, how would you compare the transformation, if I can say that, of the supposedly least dangerous branch, <laughs> excuse me, of government to the world that already exists in the administrative state that's emerging within the European Commission? Well, we've, of course, seen the transformation of the United States by the administrative state, too. I mean, it used to be the case that you couldn't delegate legislative authority outside of Congress. Of course, we all know today that the administrative branches of government make far more law and far more policy during a year period than the Congress does during an entire session. When I looked at Europe and I looked to the governmental developments and governmental developments in Europe over the past generation or two, and I don't propose to report to be an expert 
I see a further advanced development of what I'm fearing is, is coming to rise here in the United States. I see government becoming increasingly distant from the people. I see the people's attitudes and views becoming increasingly irrelevant. And I see a government in which there's just not the, the, the traditional sense of whose consent has to be given to the government and who's responsible for governing that we've traditionally had in the United States. I mean, I always think of the issue of capital punishment. I mean, the views on capital punishment between people in the United States and people in Europe isn't all that different. Significant majorities in both countries favor capital punishment. Yet we in the United States have a majority of states, two-thirds of the states that have adopted that policy because they are still reflective and responsive to the views of their people. Whereas countries like France and Germany and England and the United Kingdom and a number of other nations in Europe um, have people feel exactly the same way the government institutions don't react quite as so. Uh, quite as responsible as they do in the United States. So I don't pretend that that's where we're going to end up. I mean, you can only go to another country's history so, so far, but I think you see the tendency there that uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid uh, we're, we're moving toward the United States. And that's a very good question, too. Yes, sir. I'm wondering if you can elaborate on the privileges or immunities clause that you talked about at the beginning. Um, if I interpreted you correctly, which I may have not, it sounded like you agreed with the decision in Slaughterhouse. And I'm aware that there are those that argue that the Reconstruction Congress has actually meant to enforce, provide some enforcement for the natural rights of African Americans. So not some open-ended clause, but actually uh, inductive natural rights. And I think uh, Justice Thomas has even expressed interest or sympathy towards resuscitating the clause. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, that too is a good question. I don't pretend that all the issues I've talked about today uh, have drawn a consensus of support from every judicial conservative. There are some differences. There are, for example, some judicial conservatives who'd like to take advantage of the unidentified rights in the Ninth Amendment. I mean, we all have our favored rights. There's lots of rights that I'd love to impose on the Constitution if I could do that. And I would respectfully disagree with those people who want to use the Constitution to attain their own favored rights as much as I might personally like their favored rights. In the end, I think the most important right we have is the right to select our representatives and to determine the course of our government, and I think that's better achieved when we, yes. when we elect members of the legislature than when we have judges making these decisions for us, even when the decisions happen to be good decisions. Concerning the Privileges or Immunities Clause, you're correct again there that there is a debate, and if you'd be interested in my more detailed perspectives on the Privileges or Immunities Clause, I'd be glad to share them with you. Um, I've seen Justice's Tom, Justice Tom, Thomas's comments. I don't know that I'd go so far as to say that he's indicated a hospitality to the privileges of the was. He's just indicated he'd like to look at it more closely. Um, I've looked at that history, and for what it's worth, I don't think that history is clear at all. I certainly don't think it stands for the proposition that all natural rights can be conferred upon the people through that clause. In fact, if I was persuaded of that, I'd still be concerned about the clause because even though I'm sure you've got a very elevated sense of natural rights, and I'm sure most of the people in this room have an elevated sense of natural rights, judicial activists and those people who are part of this 21st century community also talk the terms of natural rights. I mean, you can get 10 people together and get 10 different conceptions of natural rights. So I think as a practical matter, if that concept of the Privileges or Immunities Clause becomes part of the Constitution in the year 2012, you are not going to find the advocates of this new right looking to see what Madison might have thought about it or what Lincoln might have thought about it. They are going to be looking upon it largely as an empty shell in which they and their colleagues on the bench can give, can give meaning through which they can give meaning to it. So I think you need to look at that practicality, but 
Uh, I'd be glad to share with you some more legislative history in that moment because I don't think it stands for the proposition of natural, natural rights. Yes, sir. Virginia's new Attorney General, Ken Cuccinelli, recent, recently was one of three uh, state's Attorney Generals uh, who uh, filed suit against EPA over its so-called endangerment finding. He actually filed two suits. One suit simply had to do uh, with challenging the, um, uh, the scientific basis on which EPA made its decision and asked EPA to reconsider the decision in light of the leaked emails and what have you. But it's the second one that I, that I found interesting. Uh, he, and he filed suit uh, against EPA under what he referred to as the um, double delegation doctrine, namely that the Congress had unconstitutionally delegated its lawmaking authority to an administrative body, EPA, and that EPA in turn had uh, unconstitutionally delegated its rulemaking authority to a foreign entity, namely the UN's International uh, uh, Panel on uh, Climate Change and uh, the Splendid Climate um, uh, Research Unit at East Anglia University, uh, saying that uh, both of those institutions being non-American institutions were the recipients of this double of what he referred to as the second part of the delegation. I would be interested in your thoughts on that. Thank you. Well, I, of course, I don't know the details of that particular lawsuit. I mean, the only constitutional decision I know that focused on this so-called double delegation doctrine was the Schechter Poultry case during the New Deal in which the Congress granted authority to regulate industries on industry by industry basis to the Congress, and the Congress in turn delegated that authority to um, yeah, well, I, okay. the, the Congress delegated to the, the executive branch in the NI, NRA, then delegated it to industry-wide commissions, in this case a poultry commission, to basically make rules about the, the, that, uh, that industry, the prices, the supplies all other regulatory matters relating to that industry. And the court said that that was an improper double delegation. But that was a different court and a different era, and I'm not sure that the delegation or the non-delegation doctrine of the Supreme Court um, um, before Roosevelt um, uh, made his many appointments to uh, change the direction of the court really is controlling anymore. There's been virtually no non-delegation cases that have been decided since then. Um, and there have been a number of cases that have indicated increasingly that creative kinds of separation of powers institutions, uh, like the special prosecutor and the sentencing commission and uh, things of that such are consistent with our constitutional system. I don't have any idea what the court would do. Um, this is a delegation f from the Congress to the EPA and then from the EPA to a United Nations board. Is that right? That's correct. I, you know, I just don't have any idea what a court that on a number of occasions has said that the separation of powers has to be viewed as a flexible institution, an institution that has to be given breathing room, an institution that has to be allowed so long as, as it doesn't fundamentally distort the separation of powers. I just don't know what a court would say about that, but it's a very good question. What do you think would say about it? Not what it ought to say about it, but what do you think a court would say about it? Uh, I'm impressed to uh, 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 the court system, particularly as regards this issue, because after all, it was the Supreme Court in the decision Massachusetts versus EPA that allowed EPA that allowed EPA to say uh, the, the, that the uh, uh, Supreme Court, in which, which it said that EPA could regulate man-made greenhouses, get greenhouse gases as a pollutant under the Clean Air mm -hmm. Act. That seems to me a rather bizarre uh, decision, particularly if you concern yourself with the Clean Air Act and realize that whatever else one may say about it, uh, it was not designed to deal with anything uh, any, even remotely resembling uh, man-made greenhouse gases. Well, never, never mind the double delegation. The single delegation is troubling enough here. I mean, here you have the, have the Congress for the last year and a half talking about cap and trade legislation and, you know, whether or not we're going to 
be able to adopt something along those lines, and all of a sudden the EPA says, well, you know, never mind, we're going to enact rules and regulations concerning carbon emissions. Under what standards? I mean, traditionally, a delegation from the the Congress to the executive branch has been justified to the extent that there are some clear standards, that those standards have been thought to be the only thing to transform an essentially naked delegation of legislative authority to, into effectively an executive delegation. But again, the court has increasingly said the standards don't have to be much. You know, if you delegate something to the um, Civil Aeronautics Board and you tell them to regulate the airline industry consi consistent with the public interest, that's a good enough standard. Does that provide any guidance to the CAB or the ICC or OSHA or any other, the FCC or any other agency as to what they need to do on a day-to-day -day basis and deciding rules and regulations? Not really, but nonetheless, that's been thought to survive the Constitution's separation of powers and the non-delegation. So never mind the second delegation. I don't know how the first delegation gets done. Yes, sir. This will be our final question. Uh, since we're in a little bit of a speculative area, uh, may I ask you to speculate on something that might help us with the uh, judicial ratchet to the left and hopefully either hold it in line or pull it back. It has been posited by some friends of mine uh, when looking to instigate uh, some uh, angst among the at least the Ninth Circuit, uh, if not the entire federal judiciary, that we propound um, an act dealing with the judicial conduct. And, and one of the one of the speculative things has been to just codify the grounds upon which any judge has ever been impeached at the federal level, and then put one additional section in there to you say mean, if you, you made mean a amend the constitution sir you mean amend the constitution no sir pa pass an act through the congress just codifying that under these grounds historically judges have been impeached for these reasons and they shall be good good reasons under which if, if a judge were to con conduct himself him or herself in such a manner they would be subject to impeachment and add one additional ground that being that if they were to make a ruling not based upon the Constitution or laws of the United States, but upon some foreign constitution or non-governmental organization, that they would there, thereunto also subject themselves possibly to impeachment. Might that have just the passage of such an act, if we could get it signed, certainly not by this president, uh, but passed by the Congress and enacted, uh, might that have a salutary effect upon uh, some cognitive abilities for some of these more far-ranging decisions that are emanating from penumbras of foreign constitutions and the in fealty to foreign concepts. Well, there's lots of penumbras from our constitution, too. One needn't go to um, Bolivia. Uh, there's a few penumbras here, too. I, I guess my, my short answer is I'm not sure because constitution allows impeachment for high crimes and misdemeanors. I don't think without amending the Constitution you could add to that standard, or frankly you could subtract from that standard. I think high crimes and misdemeanors is the definition, it's the standard, and again I don't think unless you use the Article 5 process to amend it, you could change that standard. Now what do high crimes and misdemeanors mean? Many of you will recall President Ford's uh, famous statement when he was actually the House minority leader and he was seeking to have uh, Justice Douglas impeached, he was asked, well, what does high crimes and misdemeanors mean to you? It means to me whatever a majority of the Congress is prepared to remove a judge for. And in a sense, that is about as good a definition of high crimes and misdemeanors as we have. We know that it doesn't have to be a crime or a felony. Um, as best as I think we can understand from looking at the history of high crimes and misdemeanors, which is a phrase that preceded the Constitution, it means corruption, corrupt behavior. So on the one hand, I don't think you can change the definition of what the Constitution currently says, but if you're sitting, if you're elected to the Congress, the House, or the Senate, and you feel that um, to rely upon uh, the law of another land where you're the custodian of this constitution is improper and uh, verging on corrupt. I don't know that you couldn't, uh, you couldn't make such a decision on your own, but I think that would have to be an individual choice on the basis of 535 members of Congress.
Um, I mean, this concept that we can look to the law of other lands, I mean, that's always been understood in the sense that, you know, nobody wants to artificially close off the kind of evidence that a judge will look to and figure out what the impact of a policy might be, but we're now at the point of giving foreign law really practical effect in defining our Constitution, which I think is a much different um, concept. And that's one of these many questions I think would be perfectly appropriate to ask a judicial nominee, not just a Supreme Court nominee, but we ought to focus on lower court nominees as well. You know, what do you think about the idea of defining Article 1, 6, uh, Clause 2 of the Constitution by what they've done in uh, Romania? Do you think it makes sense? I think it's perfectly appropriate. And um, that's part of what I'd like to see achieved by uh, introducing some of these issues more aggressively into the uh, advice and consent debate. Thank you very much for your time.